the storm. He is Lord of all. I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be the caboose on this train while going through 2 Corinthians. Or maybe it's better to use the analogy of the procession, right? I'm at the end of the procession of this, this series of lessons about this heart of 2 Corinthians. Because when we come to chapters 2 to 5, we are getting Paul's best vision of the ministry of reconciliation. He is telling us this is a struggle, this is a, a, a problem, it's a, full of wounds, it's full of hurts, but it's worth it, and it's necessary, and we're not going to give up. Now, we're dropping into the middle of a conversation here. Paul begins 2 Corinthians saying, you know, you understand me in part, but but I'm writing so that you'll have a fuller understanding, so that you can boast in us and we can boast in you. There's something going on in Corinth that has distorted the gospel in some way. So that Corinth is tending to believe in a different Jesus, an other Jesus. And so as Paul tells this story of the ministry of reconciliation, he's actually responding to a group of intruders. Because somewhere along the way, after Paul planted this church and lived with it for 18 months, and then later wrote a letter to it, and then wrote another letter to it that we call 1 Corinthians, and then made a visit that was very painful and came back and wrote another letter that was a very tearful letter, we are in the middle of a conversation where we don't have all the data, right? We we haven't heard everything that's happened. We don't know the cues. We don't know the, the whistle words. We don't know exactly what's happening. But I think we get enough to discern that Paul is concerned that the Corinthians have pursued or bought into or have admired another Jesus. These intruders, Randy referred to them on, when was that, Tuesday night, they are called the super apostles. That might be Paul's kind of labeling of them because they thought they were better. They thought they were superior to Paul. And apparently the Corinthians thought that too. At least some of them. Because these super apostles brought their own credentials with them. They brought their own triumphal message, their own triumphal procession. But as Luke pointed out, that procession is not a triumphal one. It's a procession of slaves. It's a procession of servants where Jesus leads us to the cross. But the intruders have a triumphalistic notion of ministry. And when they come into town, they they bring their credentials with them and they bring their letters of commendation. And as Chris brought us to that text, Paul's response is, I didn't bring any letters of commendation. You are my commendation. You are the one who, you know me. But the Corinthians somehow valued those letters from these intruders a little bit more. And then there's something about the power and the wealth and the glory that these super apostles took the patronage of the, of the Corinthians and they became clients and they were, were supported and the Corinthians valued them enough to support them and to give them money, and to enter into a patron-client relationship. But Paul wasn't willing to do that. He wasn't going to sell out the gospel as he perceived it, because in that moment, in that culture, there was something about Paul taking money from the Corinthians that he knew the Corinthians would misinterpret as about a function of power for them or a function of relationship. Paul did not want to lord it over them. Paul did not want to manipulate them. And so he refused the money, and the Corinthians are going, you're refusing money? 
And as Eric pointed out to us, the glory that Paul is interested in is not the position and the credentials and the power, but in the transformation of the Corinthians. And then last night, Luke took us to, Luke, to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where it begins, we will not give up. I'm not going to stop. We will not faint. And he needs to explain to the Corinthians the nature of ministry as, a, as, as Phil suggested to us and elaborated for us, carrying the body of Christ, the death of Christ in our bodies. That that's the nature of ministry. It's not about pride and power and wealth and success and triumph. That's the ministry of the super apostles. And the Corinthians have bought into it. And now they think ministry is something that is famous, credentialed, something that wows people with their rhetoric and their celebrity kind of speech, that moves people, that they're the kind of people who are thinking they're so superior that they're not going to be mentored by someone who has a smaller church than them. Super apostles. Paul says, you don't understand the gospel. That's the other Jesus that that group is promoting. It's a different Jesus because it's not a Jesus of the cross. It's not a Jesus of suffering. It's not a Jesus that gives over. It's not the Jesus who, though he was rich, became poor so that we who are poor might become rich. They have bought into a different sort of Jesus. And last night, Phil unpacked that for us. And then Christine, just a few moments ago, though she didn't quote it, she was actually doing 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Because in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13, Paul says, The spirit of faith, I believe, therefore I will speak. It's about faith, as Christine was telling us. And then in verse 14, Paul says, Because... Here's why we'll speak in faith. Because we know that God raised Jesus from the dead. And when He raised up Jesus from the dead, He raised us up with Jesus. And therefore, Paul says in chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore, we won't give up. And this is the reading of our text. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you would, stand please for the reading of the Word. This is the Word of God to the people of God. And at the end, I will say the Word of God. And if you want to express your thanks, respond, thanks be to God. So we don't lose heart. Even though our outer person is wasting away, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what, we, what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. If indeed when we have taken it off, we will not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan under our burden. Because we wish not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up in life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God. 
who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So, we are always confident. Even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we, we do have confidence. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Paul says, I'm not going to give up. This ministry is too important. It's the ministry of reconciliation. It's the message of reconciliation. God is in Christ reconciling the world to God's self. I am not going to give up. That doesn't mean I might not change jobs or I might not be a paid staff minister or whatever, whatever circumstance we may find ourselves in. But we are not going to give up the ministry of reconciliation. It is too important. But why is Paul so confident about that? And he tells us. He says, you know, there, the suffering is light and temporary. But the eternal glory is beyond comparison. Now, let's stop there just for a minute. Because... I think when we hear that suffering is light and temporary, there's a part of me that kind of goes, Ugh. I wouldn't say it that way, Paul. You know, if I was as innocent, I would have said, that. could you rephrase that one, Paul? You know, I don't know if that one's going to go so well. Because suffering doesn't feel temporary. And it doesn't feel light. People who are undergoing suffering in any of its forms, whether it's deep or not deep, Superficial, but all suffering feels heavy. It doesn't feel light. It's a burden. Even Paul calls it a burden in his own text here. But Paul wants us to see it's a light burden. And it's a temporary burden. We got to be careful. We don't want to take that language and use it to silence protesters. We don't want to take that language and dismiss lamenters. We don't want to take that language and shame people who are mourning or shame people who are lamenting. We don't want to walk up to them in the hospital and say, hey, this is light and temporary, don't worry. I don't, that's not what Paul is doing. Paul is not diminishing suffering. He talks about groaning. In fact, the suffering is so great that he groans. Or something else. It is a burden. It is a hurt. It is a wound. We need to acknowledge it. Name it. We feel it. And we have a right to feel it. But I think what Paul might say to us is give suffering its due weight. And at the same time, don't give suffering more than it's due. There's something else. There is something more. He calls it the, the, the inner person and the outer person. Now, here we got to be careful again because that language, sometimes we, we take it into a, oh, you know, it's the, it's the body that's, that's go, wasting away and, and Paul believes in an immortal soul. And so it really is the immortal soul that's really important. And we just, when we get rid of the body, we just get rid of the body. And then we go off to heaven and be an immortal soul and, and we won't worry about suffering anymore. I don't think that's what Paul's talking about again, at all. Paul is talking about we as a human person, Wes, we are wasting away. Our bodies are dissolving. They'll return to dust. We will die. Our bodies will not last. And it's not a contrast with the immortal soul. 
It's rather a contrast with the new person, the inner person. It's a contrast between Adam and Jesus, actually. That Adam body that we carry around now is a, is a dying body. It's an a, a Adamic body. You say that right, you can sound like you're cussing, right? Adamic <laughs> body, right? You put the emphasis on the right place. But it's the body that Adam has, the body that is, belongs to the dust. But the Christ body, or the Christic body, the Christic new human, has a body that, is, that has swallowed up death. And has brought life. And that is the contrast here. That the resurrection of Jesus means that our suffering is light and temporary. Because there is a weight of glory found in the resurrection of Jesus. Paul is not an escapist. All right, let me put it this way. Paul is not a Platonist. He's a new creationist. He's not a Platonist. He's a new creationist. Paul doesn't think of this body as something that will dissolve and, and be annihilated and, and disappear into nothingness. Rather, Paul thinks of the resurrection of Jesus as the body, as the building that God is building, the building that God is preparing for us that has been raised in Jesus, the new human, the inauguration of new creation, the one who begins all things new and will make all things new. That is being prepared for us in our, for our resurrection. We don't give up, Paul says, because we know we know that the earthly tent will be destroyed. The earthly tent will dissolve and return to dust. But we have a building of God or from God prepared for us in the heavens. That's the comparison. It's not that suffering's not so bad. It's rather that the glory is so good. The weight of glory in contrast to the temporary and light affliction. Even though when we feel that affliction, it doesn't feel light and it doesn't feel temporary. We can feel what we feel and we have a right to those feelings. But we also believe what we confess. We confess that God raised Jesus from the dead and that when He raised Jesus from the dead, he ra God raised us up with Jesus. And that the promise of the resurrection of Jesus is the promise of our own resurrection. And more than that, it's the promise of the resurrection of creation itself. That what God is doing in Christ is making all things new. Making new creation. Making us new creatures. So that when we dwell in Christ, we are new creatures and the old things are passing away. They're still there. They're temporary though. They're passing away. They're still there, but they're light because the glory is greater than what the suffering is. That's why we don't give up. We got something worth the journey. Not in the sense of a reward. Not in the sense of an escape. You know, kind of sometimes the critique of what I'm saying right now is that, oh, you're just an escapist. You want to escape the body and go off and live in heaven somewhere, and you don't really care about creation. You're just an escapist. I am not an escapist. I'm a liberationist. And I don't want to escape the body. I want to participate in its liberation. I don't want to escape God's good creation. I want to liberate it from its injustice. I don't want to escape God's good creation. I want to participate in the renewal of the world, in the renewal of God's work, in the making of all things new. I am not an escapist. I don't want to escape what God has created. I want to redeem what God has created and liberate it from its bondage to decay and its bondage to evil. And I can't do that, of course. But the resurrection of Jesus is what God has given us to do it. That is new creation. And that is our hope. We groan in the present. 
Oh, yeah. We groan in the suffering. Absolutely. But we also groan for the newness. And that newness has already arrived in some sense. As Paul said, I'm renewed in the inner person day by day. And that renewal is, is an affirmation of faith because it's not in what I see, it's what, in what, I, what is unseen. It's, a, it's an affirmation of faith that says, even though the world looks horrible, even though the tragedies are horrendous, and even though our own personal suffering and this global suffering is, fills, fills our coffers, we believe. We believe in what is unseen. And we believe it because it is seen in us in the renewal of the Spirit day by day. And we believe it because we see the renewal in the resurrection of Jesus. We see the renewal of creation in the resurrection of Jesus. You see, I think we have to believe Paul here. You see, when Paul says suffering is light and temporary... You know, Paul is not kind of an outsider on that one, right? Paul is not standing on the outside looking at somebody suffering saying, oh, that's pretty bad, but you know, it's really not that bad. No, Paul knows it's, it's, it's bad. In fact, if you hit the, you know, Randy mentioned some of the suffering, read the text of suffering in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I mean, three shipwrecks, right? You're getting on a boat with Paul? No. You know, not me. <laughs> Three shipwrecks, several beatings, several stoning, one stoning at least, several floggings, working with his hands, in poverty, without food, without drink, a day and a night in the deep. Oh yeah, he gets visions. You know, the super apostles, they wanted to, um, they wanted to tout their visions, right? And the Corinthians say, Paul, what's your visions? Come on, tell us, you know, let's one up these guys. And Paul says, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to boast in that. Yes, I have visions and revelations, but I'm not going to boast in that. Paul's a mystic, right? But I'm not going to boast in it. I'll tell you what's more important is the thorn in the flesh I got. Because in the thorn in the flesh, a thorn in the flesh is more important than my visions. Because a thorn in the flesh is more transformative than my visions. The thorn in the flesh humbles me, reminds me where the power comes from, reminds me that I'm incompetent, reminds me that I am insufficient, reminds me that I don't have it all together, that I'm not, I'm not the perfect person here. I'm not the one who's going to save the world. The thorn in the flesh is something I want removed, but I need it. And so when I talk about my visions, I talk in the third person. I don't, that's not what I'm going to boast about. I'm going to boast in my weakness because in my weakness I am made strong by the power of Christ. So Paul's this mystic who's, who's been to paradise, but you don't want to talk about it. Contrast that with some visions you've heard, right? Yeah. Paul knows suffering. And Paul knows the resurrection. Paul is not saying light and temporary because he, he thinks it's inconsequential. He's saying it's light and temporary because what is unseen is so much more glorious than what we see. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. We see a lot of things in the world. Discouraging stuff. Christine, just a moment ago, went through a whole litany of this, right? Right? We know that story. We've had our own intruder, you might say. Paul had his super apostles. We've had COVID. And the intruder came in and just like those super apostles, created a disturbance in such a way that Paul was hurt and wounded and disappointed in the Corinthians. I'm your parent. I loved you. How can you behave this way? Don't you know the gospel? I know that feeling from the intruder we call COVID. How 
how we respond to the intruder, the intruder, is with faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Now, faith here is not about believing in things when common sense tells you not to. Believe, faith here is not about um, some kind of leap into space. Faith here is about seeing in the work of Christ, in the death and resurrection of Christ, the beginning of new creation. We walk by the value of new creation. We believe in new creation. And we walk by faith in the new creation because that's what's going to shape us. That's what's going to form us. We're going to walk not by what we see, because what we see is dying bodies. There's no hope there. But by faith, we see something else. We see new creation. We see it in ourselves by the transformation of the Spirit. We see it in other people who are our letters of commendation as well as we are their letters of commendation. We see it in the church's confession of the resurrection of Jesus. We walk by faith. So Paul says we are confident. It's hard, hard to get to that list of Paul's suffering and say, oh, and we're confident. We're bold. You know, we're not, we're not done. We are confident. Because here's what's something we know. We know that when the building, when our tent is destroyed, there's a building for us that's eternal. We, we know that. But we also know that whether we are at home in the body and at away from the Lord, or whether we are at home with the Lord and away from the body, we know what our task is. We know what our task is to participate in this new creation to participate in the ministry of reconciliation. That that is our aim. That's our goal. Not to, not to stand over against it and work against that ministry of reconciliation, but to participate in that mission, participate in that message, and become ministers of reconciliation, ministers of the new covenant. Whether we're at home in the body, or whether we're in at home with the Lord. We are confident. Now, I don't know if, how you understand or take that language. It's, it's a debated, you know, people debate, scholars debate what this means, and, and I don't have the, the final answer on that one. I'm not even necessarily going to share my opinion about it, but here's what I do think about it. Here's what I do, I think, know about it. That as we live by faith in this world, with all the sights that want to undermine and subvert that faith. As we live by faith in this world, we have a confidence that there is a home with the Lord. That whether we are absent from the body and at home with the Lord, or at home in the body and absent from the Lord, there is a sense in which we are a people who know our comfort. The Lord has not abandoned us. When we're in the body, yeah, the Lord is away. There's a sense in which the Lord is away that when we are away from the body, there's a sense in which the Lord is at home. We are at home with the Lord in contrast to the body. I don't know exactly how to explain that. I mean, there are a lot of theories. Some would say, well, it's like when you die and you, um, you go to sleep. And you wake up in the resurrection. Yeah, okay, that, that could be. Or some would say, no, when you die, you become naked. But though you're naked, you're still at home with the Lord. You're still with the Lord. Okay, that's possible too. But others would say, you know, no, it's when, when you die, you, you, you get that resurrection body right away because you're at home with the Lord. Well, okay, maybe. That's, that's not what I want to debate. What I want to hear is that I, that I have the confidence that I am at home with the Lord even when I'm away from the body. I don't give up 
Because whether I'm in the body or out of the body, whether I'm away from the body or I'm at home with the Lord, I'm with the Lord. This time of year is a difficult time of year for me. April the 30th was, is the anniversary of my first wife's death. She passed away in 1980, suddenly, unexpectedly, after having some surgery that was supposed to not be any threat to her. But she died. May 21st is the anniversary of my son's death where we literally watched his body waste away for over 10 years. 10 years, he slowly degenerated. May 21, at the age of 16, in 2001. So I find, my spa- my, I find myself living in this space between the anniversary of my wife's death and the anniversary of my son's death, and, and that space is, is, is pretty cloudy space. It's pretty foggy space. And for many years, it was debilitating to me. And I didn't know quite what to do with it. In fact, I went through years without grieving because I resisted grief. But I've learned different in the last 15 years or so. That I've learned to kind of sit in this space and to acknowledge their absence. To grieve that absence. But here's how I have found a path to help me do that. I don't know that it would be good for everybody to do it. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just telling you my story. You see, I, I, don't, um, I don't like graves. I, I, for years, I didn't visit graves. I didn't visit the grave of my wife and the grave of my son. I didn't like graves. They seem so permanent. They seem so victorious. Just the presence, being in the presence of a grave. Now, that may not be true for you. You may find great comfort in going to the grave. Praise God. Use whatever God gives you for comfort. Absolutely. But it wasn't for me. It was a testimony of how the grave won. How God, I guess, said no to the prayers for my wife's healing. And she died at 25. And, and God said no to the prayers of, we want a, we want a son who we can raise up. We're going to name him Joshua because we want him to be a leader of God's people. We want to give him a name that gives him a vision. We thought about Jesus, but we thought that was a little much. Right? <laughs> so we, we, we took the Hebrew name, right? Joshua. It, you said no to that, God. If you didn't say no, then you just said nothing? Like you're impotent? Like you don't care? So how, what, you know, there's this, this space of anger with God and questioning of God and, and a kind of bafflement, confusion. And between April 30th and May 21, I, have a, I can go back to that. I can, it's like a trigger, you know, it, it takes me back there and I can feel that all again. And I can groan, I can lament, and I can hurt, and I feel the wounds. But here's a practice that I I began, oh, 13 years ago. It's the practice of, of going to Joshua's grave. I would get up on Easter morning. I, I do this every year if I'm in town. I get up on Easter morning, and I go to the grave of my son, As I travel down there, I listen to lament songs. I listen to Psalm 13. I listen to Psalm 88, Psalm 77. I listen to music that's lament music. I listen to Michael Peterson. Uh, We we, uh, 
Come back soon. We beat on the wall of the womb, crying for deliverance. Yeah. And I get to the grave, and I sit in the dark. He's interred with ashes, and he's, he's in a wall with just kind of his name across. That's all there is room for. It's just Joshua Mark Hicks. And I sit on the bench, and I wait for the sun to rise. And I remember, and I lament, and I mourn. And as the sun begins to rise, I'll take my hand, and I'll and I'll move my hand over his name like like I'm feeling Braille, reading it in Braille. And here's something I say. You are at home with the Lord. I miss you. You're away from your body. But you are at home with the Lord. I don't know exactly how he experiences that. I'd like to talk to him about it, you know, but, but I don't know how he experiences that. But I put my hand on that and read it like Brown said, you are at home with the Lord. And then I get up, get back in my car, and I drive to Easter service. And I gather at Easter service, my brothers and sisters, and we come together to confess together the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We come together to celebrate the resurrection. We come together to say, they're home with the, with the Lord, but death is not going to win. Death is not going to have this victory. It looks like death is winning. It looks like suffering is destroying us. It looks like the pandemic has hurt and wounded the church in a mortal way. But it hasn't happened. Because resurrection has happened. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus. A new creation has begun. It's begun in my heart. It's begun in your heart. And it will transform us on the inside. And it will also transform us in our bodies. Resurrection. And I love that moment because here's what I believe about that moment. I believe in that moment, heaven and earth come together as one. When the community of God assembles, just as we have assembled here today, and we sing the songs and we sing praises and we hear the word and we talk with one another and we encourage one another and we bring hope to each other. God is present among us. Not only God is present, but the hosts of heaven are present. In Hebrews chapter 12, Paul, whoever it was, I don't know if it was Paul or not, the Hebrew writer, you know, which is some, that's an old habit from, you know, when I was a teenager. That's my 12 year old. Paul said in Hebrews. That's how I did it back then. <laughs> so it comes out every now and then. But in Hebrews 12, you know, the writer says, uh, we have not come to a mountain that can be touched. We have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. We have come to the city of the living God. We have come to God. And we have come to the angels gathered in festive assembly. And we have come to those who are enrolled in heaven, the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And we have come to Jesus, and we have come, notice this one, we have come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Somebody, you know, we can have different opinions about that one, but I'll tell you what it means for me. That when I go to church, and I use that word, I use that phrase deliberately, I know it can be misunderstood. I know it can be go to church and you leave church at Sunday and you just do, do what you want Monday through Friday or whatever. Now, what I mean go to church, I mean go to the assembly and to the assembly that is united with the assembly in heaven and where in heaven they're singing. The angels are singing holy, holy, holy. And the 24 elders, right, are around the throne and they're singing holy, holy, holy. And that the host of heaven, in my mind and in my vision, 
the great multitude that cannot be counted from every language, tribe, and nation are gathered before the throne and they are singing holy, holy, holy. And I imagine with a sanctified imagination, can you imagine it? Can you imagine it? Joining that chorus when we sing. Joining the chorus that says, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Joining the chorus that sings, Worthy is the Lamb. We are not alone. We are not ten. We are not forty. We are not a hundred. We are not a thousand. We are millions who are singing praise to God and joining the choir, joining the heavenly choir to sing holy, holy, holy. And with my imagination, hopefully it's a sanctified one, but with my imagination, standing right there a moment ago, singing with united voice, I imagine my son right beside me. That's why I'm happy when I'm singing, okay? Because I don't go to the grave to visit my son. You know where I go? I go to church. Because in church, heaven and earth are united. That's where we go. And I've asked United Voice to sing a song we sang last night. I'd never heard it before. Sorry if it's on one of your discs and I just haven't heard that. But I'd I'd never heard it before. But if if you go to see my insides, I was busting. Because it's exactly the celebratory song that we should sing in assemblies. Not that there's not a place for lament in assemblies. Of course there is. But there's also a memory not only of lament, but a memory also of new creation is better. That the suffering is light and temporary. Hard, painful, wounding, yes. But light and temporary in comparison to the glory of Jesus Christ who has been raised from the dead and will make all things new. And when we sing this particular song, which I've asked them to do again, I hope you do it exactly like you did. <laughs> you know, uh, join the chorus, brothers and sisters. Sing it. Stand. Yell. Shout. Have some joy because our loved ones are at home with the Lord. And when we join them here, when we sing here, we become a part of that assembly. We become part of that procession. Procession that leads us to the right hand of God where Jesus Christ sits over all things. And He will reign forever. And He will reign until every enemy is put under His feet. And the last enemy is death. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith in the resurrection, not by the gravestone in the cemetery. May God be praised.